What's the difference between the Specialized Future Shock 1.5 and the higher end 2.0? Are you curious about the weights and the specs of both? Should you upgrade from the 1.5 to the 2.0? And are they even compatible if you wanted to? Answers to all these questions and more in this video. So my 2021 Specialized Diverge Sport Carbon came with the Future Shock 1.5 that I've been riding essentially since I got the bike. But I've always wondered what the 2.0 would feel like by comparison and whether or not it would be worth the upgrade. Now, fortunately for me, I was recently able to source a Future Shock 2.0 and I've been putting both to the test and riding with a critical eye for the pros and cons of each. Now I've got a pretty good sense for how both units ride and I have some thoughts on why you might prefer one over the other. But before we get into all that, let's quickly discuss the differences between the two suspension cartridges. Now the Future Shock system is of course Specialized Bikes proprietary suspension system that allows for 20 millimeters of axial travel to soak up small amplitude vibrations and reduce rider fatigue. It comes on several of specialized offerings, including the Diverge, the Roubaix, the Ruby, and the Cirrus. Now at its core, it's a mass spring damper system, just like on mountain bike suspension, and the two primary adjustments that you can make are the spring rate, or the effective stiffness of the spring, and the rebound damping rate, which is how slowly or quickly the system returns to equilibrium after being compressed. Now the Future Shock itself comes in two flavors. The base 1.5 has a main internal spring, but if the default spring rate is too soft for you, you do have the ability to bump up the effective spring rate by adding one of three additional helper springs. Now, depending on the bike that you have, the helper springs will either be linear or progressive, but the point here is that on the 1.5 model, you can essentially choose from four distinct spring rates to help soak up road chatter in the front end. Now, if you need help switching your helper springs on your 1.5 model, this video up here will walk you through that process. It's important to note here that there is no damping adjustment on the Future Shock 1.5 model. Now, while the Future Shock 1.5 is essentially a fixed damper, adjustable spring rate system, the Future Shock 2.0 actually takes the opposite approach. With the 2.0, there are no helper springs, and there's only one internal fixed spring that provides a restoring force to the system. In other words, you cannot change the spring on the 2.0 unit. However, in this system, the damping is the tunable parameter, and the premium feature here is that the damping is actually user-selectable on the fly by turning this knob here, which adjusts the damping from very low, much like the 1.5, all the way up to highly damped, which resembles a lockout feature you'd find on mountain bike suspension. Now, while there is only one spring on the 2.0 model, the effect of adjusting the damping across the spectrum manifests as a range of rider experiences, from lots of motion and highly sensitive to small bumps, all the way to nearly zero motion, almost locked out, and virtually unresponsive to high frequency chatter in the road. So that's the primary functional difference between the 1.5 and the 2.0. The 1.5 is a fixed damper adjustable spring rate system, and the 2.0 is a fixed spring rate adjustable damping system with on the fly adjustment, of course. Now, there are also some differences in the weight and the dimensions. For starters, the Future Shock 1.5 comes in at 305.7 grams, while the adjustable Future Shock 2.0 unit comes in at 348.9 grams, or 43.2 grams heavier than the basic 1.5 unit. Which I guess isn't surprising given the adjustable damping feature, but typically when you upgrade to a more premium bike part, the weight usually goes down. Now many of you have been asking if you can interchange the units or upgrade from 1.5 to 2.0. Now I'm pleased to report in a world of a million different standards that these two are in fact compatible and I have confirmed that you can indeed switch between the Future Shock 1.5 or the 2.0 system with no additional hardware or adapters. That is just some good solid information right there. Perhaps even worth hitting the subscribe button, no? Huh? That's fine. Now in my case, I've actually been going back and forth, testing both of these units to get a feel for each, and while there are a couple of inconsequential dimensional discrepancies, the important ones being the stem mounting diameter, the stem mounting height, and the main cartridge diameter are the same across both units. Now the process for removing and installing the Future Shock system is pretty well detailed in this video up here, so I'm not gonna cover that procedure here, but keep in mind that it's the same process for both the 1.5 and the 2.0 systems, with the one exception that on the 2.0 model, you do have to remove the adjustment knob first via the 1.5 millimeter set screw on the side. Now then, the big question of course, 
What's the actual difference in the ride experience between these two systems? Well, I'll start with the base 1.5 model since that's what came on my bike, and then I'll discuss whether I think the 2.0 is a substantial upgrade and ultimately worth the difference in price. Now, when I first got the bike, I rode the FutureShock 1.5 around with no helper springs installed, and I did notice that it was really active. And while the handlebars didn't feel disconnected or floaty as I thought they might, I did notice the axial motion in the bars as I rode, and it was a little bit strange to get used to. So I tried the different helper springs and ultimately settled on the middleweight spring as a happy medium, and I haven't really touched it since. With the midweight spring installed, for my weight of about 155 pounds, it seems to do a good job of absorbing road chatter without bobbing too much during normal use. So the 1.5 unit is basically a set it and forget it option, as you're unlikely to continually be changing springs for different scenarios since the process to swap the springs while straightforward can't really be done on the fly. And this is essentially the big selling point for the FutureShock 2.0. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the mechanisms for increasing the perceived stiffness of the system are different on both systems. And in the case of the 2.0, it's a knob on the top that allows the user to adjust the effective damping in the system. Now at its softest or least damped setting, it really does feel like the FutureShock 1.5. It's really active and really sensitive to small perturbations in the road. On both the 1.5 and the 2.0, it's visually apparent as you can see the high frequency compressions of the shock boot as you ride. Then when you max out the 2.0 adjustment knob, while it's not technically locked out, it's really over damped to the point where you need to put a lot of weight on it and hold it there for a second or two to get it to compress. Now when riding, the end result is that it essentially feels locked out since the range of frequencies of the road vibrations is much higher than the roll-off frequency for the system, which is essentially modeled as a second-order mechanical low-pass filter. Engineering terms aside, this basically means that when you dial the knob to fully damped, it really does feel like a rigid front end, which some cyclists may prefer. Now, I will say that between the two endpoints, open and fully damped, there aren't a ton of intermediate options. In other words, for the first half of the adjustment range, the feel at the handlebars is, well, pretty much the same. And then maybe through a small range, say between 60 and 80% or so, there's a little bit of tunability, but anything approaching the last 10% or so of the adjustment range is basically fully locked out. And I often hear people quoting that one of the big benefits of running the FutureShock 2.0 is simply that it is oil damped, as if that itself is a meaningful property. Now, while it's true that this is an oil damped unit, it's important to remember that the damping is itself the adjustable parameter. So when you're at close to full open on the adjustment knob, you're not really very damped at all. In other words, at this end of the spectrum, the feel really resembles that of the 1.5. Now, after a few test rides on each, I'm inclined to say that Specialized may have been better off just incorporating a lockout switch, much like you would find on mountain bike suspension. It could likely have been a lot lighter, less complex, and still offer the rider an on-the-fly adjustment in the form of a lockout switch. So what I'm saying is that I ultimately didn't find the adjustment knob particularly useful, and if anything, I usually just end up opening it all the way for a chunky descent, and then fully locking it out on smooth roads. So at the end of the day, is the FutureShock 2.0 really worth the upgrade over the more basic but still functional 1.5? Well, for me, likely not, especially since it comes at a weight penalty rather than a weight savings. I will say, however, if you are someone who appreciates the squish up in the front end, but is also really sensitive to the motion in the bars during hard efforts on smooth roads, then it may be worth a closer look. However, I would not upgrade to the 2.0 hoping for a system that offers precise and incremental jumps in the system's damping. It's essentially a binary system, either fully open or fully closed, with maybe a little bit of functional adjustability in the middle of the range. For me, the adjustment knob was not an absolute game changer. Now, in my experience, the axial compliance in the front end offered by the 1.5 is actually really nice. And when I switch to a bike with a rigid front end now, I actually do miss the future shock and the compliance that it offers. When riding the 2.0, I find that I want to think that locking it out on smooth roads is gonna make me more efficient, but I can't really confirm that it actually does. And since the motion on the 1.5 system doesn't bother me, I can't really see the motivation for the 2.0. Now, zooming out a little bit, I do feel that the future shock systems in general, both the 1.5 and the 2.0, are wildly over-engineered. 
And if you check out my other video on how to repair this 2.0 unit, you can really see what's going on inside and get a sense for the sheer number of parts involved and similarly, the sheer number of potential failure modes. Now, while I love my Specialized Diverge, I do think that I would prefer a bike with a simpler, more traditional fork and headset design, and then maybe use a suspension solution like the Redshift stem, for instance. So there you have it, a full comparison between the Specialized Future Shock 1.5 and the Top Shelf 2.0 model. And yes, we did learn that they are in fact compatible, so you can decide for yourself which one you want to run on your Future Shock equipped bike. Now, of course, sourcing a 1.5 or a 2.0 cartridge can be challenging as you do have to go through an authorized Specialized dealer to get one, but it's not impossible and you now know the main differences between the two so you can make a more educated decision. That's going to wrap it up for this one. Thanks for watching and thanks again for subscribing if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.